Um, firstly, can I just acknowledge a couple of your speakers that are going to be here today or may have been here yesterday. Um, firstly is my very dear friend and colleague, Andrew Robb, who was the Trade Minister. And Andrew was the person who oversaw the finalisation of the trade arrangements in uh, Japan, Korea and China. Um, I'm from Remmark in the Riverland in South Australia and the fruit growers and the wine industry in that region think Andrew's an absolute rock star because these FTAs have been total game changers for our region. We've seen exports soar, we've seen farm grape prices rise, um, and these new and improved market accesses have made business in my community profitable again. And I think that's a fantastic legacy for Andrew to have left the Australian economy and Australian agriculture. Uh, the other is, uh, is Ryan Arnold from Piap in Loxton, also in the Riverland in South Australia. Might as well make the most of my opportunity to shout out my own. Um, and he's part of your speaking program as well. And I'm sure he'll back up what I'm saying about the change to our region in the Riverland by these FTAs. But Ryan himself and his family have been great leaders and are very well respected in the Riverland as innovators. Uh, and it's great that he's involved in this conference because his business has been at the lead and pioneered uh, many industry leading technologies and methods to improve crop production and protect protection. So I'm sure you'll find what he's got to say extremely interesting. Uh, and it's great that we've got him along here to share um, some of the things that he's done because there's so many people here who've got a story to tell. I mean, reality is the people in this room represent the cream of the crop and the best of Australian ag agriculture, and we have a huge amount to offer. I mean, the fact that our farmers feed 60 million people um, around the world, that our agricultural industries produce some of the best food and fibre on the planet, it's safe and it's clean, and the world basically wants it. Um, we have fantastic seafood industries, we've got a thriving forestry sector, and we're world leaders in water management, despite the rubbish you might have heard of recent times um, being fed to us by those who actually should know better. And I've just momentarily digress on water, despite the fact that somebody's told me I shouldn't be talking about water today. Um, but the reality is that the Murray-Darling Basin Plan was a very, very complex document. It was a very complex initiative. It took us 100 years for us to get to agree amongst all the states and territories in the Commonwealth on what we needed to do to make our river system sustainable into the future. It is a shared resource. It doesn't belong to any one group, but it doesn't um, equally. It belongs to every single group, whether you're an irrigator, a river community, somebody who lives far away who, who believes in, the, in our environmental assets. Um, you know, it is something that provides provides food, that uh, we grow food that goes on everybody's table, not just those people that live in the basin, but the people who live in the capital cities who seem to have a greater opinion about how we should be managing our system than those that rely on it every single day. And as farmers, we all know that if we don't have a water source, we don't have an agricultural economy. So I've been calling out and saying to everybody, we've got to stop the politics, we've got to get on with the job, we need to deliver this plan, that is the outcome that we have to have. But we also should be extraordinarily proud of the achievements in water management. Um, and just as we are extremely proud of the achievements that we've had in, you know, in agriculture more generally, you know, we are often the world front runners in adapting and adopting new technologies and methods. Um, and often it's us that actually gets to, to invent things simply because we've got a problem that we need to solve. Um, we've got an agricultural research and development sector which is absolutely the envy of the rest of the world. And we often export that agricultural expertise to assist other countries with their food production. But as good as we are, I truly believe that where we are at the moment is not going to be remotely good enough into the future. Um, at best, I think what we've achieved to date will provide a, a, a very solid foundation on which we must now build and transform agriculture and the food system so that we can meet the critical challenges of the future. I mean, many of these challenges are already upon us. Um, some of them will be domestic, um, like the, the increased pressure that we're already seeing on biosecurity because of a, a much more mo uh, transient um, uh, global economy. Um, while others will reflect uh, the world and the place in the international world, I think probably uh, the hardest and the most obvious uh, is going to be our ability to achieve um, the development goals that we've set for ourselves, most particularly that um, the population around the world is uh, set to reach 10 billion people by 2050, 11 uh, billion by the year um, 2100. That's an awful lot of additional mouths that we have to feed and it represents a massive, massive surge in the demand for agricultural output over the next 30 years. 
Um, income growth in many places around the world, particularly uh, in Asia, is resulting a, from a significant shift away from uh, the, uh, the cereals and similar crops of the past and towards meat, dairy, fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, and global agricultural product productivity is improving generally, but yield has slowed, and that's something I think that we all should be very concerned about. How we address this critical issue, um, the world is, is going to be hampered by a number of things, particularly things like resource, um, de natural resource degradation, the loss of biodiversity and the spread of pests and diseases, which inevitably come with increased trade. Um, and at the risk of sounding like a greenie, I think climate change will have all sorts of impacts and we have to be extremely careful that we don't make matters worse while we try and increase the productivity demands that are going to be upon us. And whilst countries like Australia, I truly believe, are well ahead of the curve in responding to this challenge, it's probably worth noting that, it's, uh, that, that climate change is likely to disproportionately impact regions that have historically not always enjoyed food security. And that means uh, conflict is a huge risk in food production and distribution. And, and the current geopolitical environment we find ourselves in probably shouldn't give us any cause for great comfort. Nor does the extreme poverty that's still experienced by around 10% of the world's population, uh, including many in the Asia Pacific region, our very own region, and in many rural areas, po poverty in itself is a source of conflict. Um, Considerable strides obviously have been made to reduce hunger and poor nutrition among the world's poorest, but hundreds of millions of people still go to bed hungry every night and uh, billions still suffer from nutrient deficiencies. So competition for resources like uh, arable land and fresh water essential for agriculture will also remain a cause and source for conflict, and this competition can only increase. But you know, as many of you are no doubt aware, uh, are aware, just doing more with the same and growing more food just is no longer an option for the world. You know, high import resource intensive farming systems have generally kept seven billion people fed, but they're causing some long term problems. Quite simply, they're not sustainable and they rely heavily on finite resources. So we need new systems that are not only going to be completely sustainable, but which actually address and even reverse the negative environmental impacts while also increasing global um, agricultural output by 50% in 30 years. It's no mean feat that we have before us. So I think we need to completely rethink how we distribute food, uh, where we produce it so we reduce some um, food miles, and make food systems more resilient to shocks and disruptions. Um, I don't think I'm saying anything that's unfamiliar here, and I certainly wouldn't suggest that I've exhausted all the challenges that are before us. Um, and it's certainly not my intention to paint a bleak picture. In fact, I believe that with all these challenges come extraordinary opportunities for Australia. I think these opportunities can be met and the challenges can be dealt with. Um, and I believe that Australia not only can play a leading role in this particular area, but I believe that we can play the leading role. And it will be through the investment in, uh, in the, the clever, the unique, the innovative and the resilient agricultural industries that you represent uh, that we will be able to ascend to the top of the global agricultural pile. Um, how do we meet these challenges? Uh, while ensuring Australia is, uh, is universally recognised, lauded and continues to be applauded for the very best agriculture nation in the world? How do we ensure global demand for Australian food and fibre exceeds those of other nations? How do we ensure that Australia, uh, which sets the highest global benchmark for natural resource management and environmental and sustainability is, is ensured? How do we ensure that it's Australia which leads the world in strengthening resilience of what's becoming an increasingly fragile food production and distribution system? Um, perhaps some people don't believe Australia can or should strive for these goals, and, and I admit they are ambitious, but I really don't think we have any choice. I think it's imperative that we aim for the top. I think it's essential that we are to securing a safe and prosperous future for our country. And I consider that to be my primary responsibility as a lawmaker and electorate representative. But I think it's going to require a huge nat uh, national effort and a massive investment. Um, we need to make sure our investments in R&D aren't just spending money but are actually delivering efficient and effective outcomes, that they are an investment and no longer a subsidy. We need to make sure that we have a strong input from our farming sector in our decision making. Don't leave the decisions to government, you're better placed to make them than I am. We need to also deliver clear and united targets nationally. 
um, not just within our particular industry sectors, but we need to have a very clear national goal, uh, set of goals and directions. And most particularly, we need to sell our story better. We are the most sustainable and responsible farmers in the world, but we've got to make sure that everybody knows that. Not so much overseas, I think they already believe that, but maybe in Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and, uh, and Brisbane. Um, but if we are successful in our, in our goals, we will, I think, as an agricultural sector, be rewarded greatly. And I say we because, actually, I don't really mean we, I actually really mean you. Because I think governments can help, uh, and there's no doubt that the government that I'm a part of is absolutely willing to help. But the impetus uh, in, and the innovation that we need will rest with the farmers and their industries rather than politicians and bureaucrats. It rests with the operators and the companies up and down the agricultural supply chain. It rests with researchers, it rests with teachers and it rests with students in our agricultural scientists, our engineers and our technicians who develop and build the machines and the new technologies that we must employ. And it rests with the markets and the consumers as well. We can't dismiss or ignore any ideas, any technologies or any in, in, uh, innovations in pursuit of our goals. Um, some developments are no-brainers, of course. Um, you know, for mine, the greatest potential um, is that precious five centimetres of topsoil. You know, we know that, that uh, more than 90% of our land's biomass comes from that area, but we also need to learn from things like macro and microscopic organisms and, and the interdependency of our ecosystems. You know, we've barely scratched the surface when we start looking at this. Um, you know, some of these products have been in the market for, for ages, but I still think we're largely operating in the dark in this respect. And I believe it's absolutely essential we unearth as much information about these particular areas as possible. Um, we can also reduce soil uh, emissions and, and erosions, improve water holding capacity and lock in carbon wherever we see it. But one of my uh, really, really things that I, I really think are tremendously important is, uh, is food waste. You know, I despair when I see the amount of perfectly sound food uh, which gets wasted every year in Australia and around the developed world. You know, it's patently ridiculous that a farmer should chuck 30% of his crop on the ground just because it doesn't meet this, the precise exacting uh, requirements of a buyer because it might not be the right size or it might have a tiny blemish on the surface of the product. Working to eliminate food waste, I think, will be one of the two major components of us uh, taking pressure off the need for increased global agricultural output. Um, and, you know, there are so many other things that we could be talking about, GM, robotics and drones, you know, farm forestry, reclaiming urban spaces for more localised fresh fruit, food production, conservation farming, or a myriad of other innovations that are being tried or utilised today. I mean, who would have thought of five years ago, five years ago that we would be trialling virtual fencing um, or that the, the meat and livestock industry will be seeking to have um, a, a neutral carbon footprint into the future. I mean, these are amazing initiatives to be commended. But we have to explore everything. We can't be ignorant to anything. And we have to utilise every single thing that can put Australia on the top of the pile. Just a couple more things before I let you get back to doing the real job here today, and that's planning for Australia's agricultural future. Um, as I said, it's Australian farmers and their industries, represented by you here today, who will be critical in the future of Australian agriculture. It won't be governments, because it's left to governments, it just plainly won't be done. Governments certainly talk about the long-term future, and, and that's what we should be doing, but it, often we are forced to think in the short term. You know, governments like Sir Robert Menzies and Sir Thomas Playford had the luxury of longevity in this respect. But the reality of Australian politics at the moment and the trends that we're seeing in recent elections suggest an increasingly shorter term focus. Mandates and agreements can't be taken for granted anymore when you have the narrow vested interests simply seeking to spoil and disrupt utilising power while accepting no responsibility for their actions. Um, I contend that we have seen a perfect example of this in recent respect to, to the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, this was just absolutely nothing more than naked politicking um, and I think a case in point for why you should take responsibility into your own hands and not leave it with government. But as I said, um, industry needs to drive this transformation and drive government's role in it too. Um, you should be making decisions about your own industry and telling us as the government what you want us to do, ensuring that we have the right policy settings, investing in the right infrastructure and engaging in the right international partners in trade and commerce. It's not a government role to lead in this respect, but to serve. And I sometimes just plainly for us to get out of your way.
And speaking of vested interests uh, who only spoil and disrupt, disrupt, I'm sure many of you despair at those unaccountable elements of our society which routinely and misleading malign Australian agriculture. They're the ones who've never nursed a sick animal up back to health through the night. They're the ones who've never sat and, and worked under the scorching sun, building, rebuilding fences after a flood or a fire. They're not the ones who've had to sit by helplessly in five minutes after a hailstorm has gone through and realised your work for a whole year has been destroyed in a matter of a few minutes. They have no skin in the game, and yet they have the power and they're becoming increasingly brazen in using it. We've seen them attack resources in the mining sector, but be very sure their attention is increasingly turning towards agriculture, fisheries and forestry. Um, as an example, my office was recently targeted with a blatantly false and mis misleading campaign alleging that there were going to be hordes of foreign fishing vessels were going to be unleashed on Australian waters to pillage and plunder every fish that we had in our waters. We received 12,000 emails in the matter of a few hours. And yet, um, we have not received one single application for a foreign fishing vessel to fish in Australian waters, let alone approved one. So these are the elements that we need to be very, very, very concerned about, for they have great contempt for Australia, its people, and particularly for our agricultural sector. But we can marginalise these people and these forces that are arrayed against us um, by making sure that we are the world leaders um, in everything that we do. And we can hold them to account where they've previously be, been unaccountable by reinstating and reintroducing science and facts back into the argument. Accountability is the very last thing that they want. Um, in any case, um, I can absolutely assure you the government of which I am a member um, will do everything we can to stop these forces from coming towards you. But enough of that. Thank you very much for the opportunity for be, being able to be here today. I really look forward to hearing the outcomes of this meeting because I truly believe the future of Australian agriculture sits in this room. Thank you. <clears throat> So she's got uh, Senator Rustin has some time before she has to leave. So would there be any questions? I can yeah, exactly. ask one. Yeah, I can't see any for the minute. Um, the fruit fly outbreaks that we've mm. seen coming down from Queensland, Tasmania has outbreaks, possibly from Victoria, and South Australia has more. Um, what are you hearing from our overseas markets with, um, you know, whether protocols would be changed or trading arrangements changed? Mm. Look, as, as much as it's distressing to see any outbreak of any disease in Australia, the one thing that we have done internationally is established our credentials um, in response to, to outbreaks of fruit fly. Uh, we had a couple of outbreaks in South Australia two years ago uh, in the Riverland, uh, and the response of the South Australian government and the set or the, the sort of the response manual, um, which we used as part of our protocols in international markets, has meant that our international markets, whilst they're watching, make no doubt they are, uh, you know, they are watching what's going on. They were, uh, I think, so impressed at the response um, and reaction that we had to previous outbreaks uh, that they are giving us the opportunity to, to see if we uh, are equally as capable of delivering these responses in, in other markets. Uh, can I you know, shout out for the South Australian Labor government? Can you believe that? I'm shouting out to a Labor government. But their response in assisting Tasmania with the outbreaks recently was phenomenal, and they should be commended for doing that, because biosecurity obviously is not something that sits within a state. So um, I think what we must continue to do is to be, like I said, head of the world in our responses to, to these things, because the rest of the world understands, just like we understand, there will be outbreaks from time, time to time. We can never expect in, in such a, um, a, a world with such increased mobility that we won't have outbreaks. It will be how we respond to those outbreaks um, is, is how we will be judged by the rest of the world. And it's fantastic to see that we've already established that, because to date, uh, we haven't had any negative response from our, our partners unless something happened in the last 24 hours. So um, I think it's an absolute um, credit to us all that we, are, um, we have such great response plans in place. I can't see another question up there, but I'm interested in the Murray-Darling Basin plan. So where do you see it coming back to at this point? Um, 
Look, there's no doubt, um, well, first of all, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is not just a plan. It is a series of different elements that make a bigger plan. Included in that were not only the 2750 of, of gap water that we agreed, um, there was the Northern Basin Review that was built into the plan, there was the SDL Adjustment um, Program that was built into the plan, and over and above that, there was a 450 um, gigalitres of increased water um, after the plan had been, the first part of the plan had been delivered to 2024. What happened a couple of weeks ago with the disallowance of the Northern Basin Review was, in effect, um, somebody took a piece of the plan away. Uh, and understandably, New South Wales and Victoria were particularly annoyed, particularly New South Wales, because it affects their farmers in the north of their state, uh, and of course the farmers in Queensland. The most important thing that I think we can do is to just, you know, everyone needs to call their jets, they need to come back to the table. I believe that we have a mechanism by which we can reintroduce um, that, uh, that particular review amendment so that we can get the Northern Basin up and running. Um, but it's always difficult to get the horses back in the stable after they've bolted. And it, it was a, it was, I felt disgusted to be a politician that week because everybody had agreed that we had to work together to get the plan. We've had bipartisan support for this plan since uh, 2012 when it was signed off under then Minister Burke. And for, I believe, um, South Australian election political reasons, the South Australian Labor Party joined with the Greens and the Nick Xenophon team to blow this up. If this had been an issue that was on the table on the 18th of March, I read the South Australian election is on the 17th of March, I don't believe that we'd even be having this discussion. So um, very sad politicking, but I truly believe we can get it back on track and get on with it because Australia needs um, for our reputation as the best in the world to have the best water management in the world in the Murray-Darling Basin. Got a question up there. Uh, yes, Jim Prattley from Charles Sturt University, Wagga. Um, thanks, Senator, for a very uh, interesting and uh, constructive talk. Uh, one of the issues, though, uh, that's uh, appearing in the university sector is the uh, uh, cap that's been put on the funding for university students. Now, in principle, I don't have a particular problem with that. <coughs> But it's got an unintended consequence and it relates to agricultural education. Uh, what we're seeing, and it might just be uh, you know, the interim phase, but uh, some universities are saying, well, we can actually uh, teach three commerce students for one agriculture student. And so we'll go with the numbers rather than with the needs of the community. And so I'm just wondering whether that issue could be uh, reconsidered in terms of, of the needs of the country and, and perhaps reintroduction of quotas on, on uh, important uh, areas of study. Hmm. Um, at the risk of sounding cheeky, I'd say that if, if the university truly believes that the demand is out there for agricultural students, they probably shouldn't be chasing the money. They should be chasing what the economy wants in terms of the students that they're they're, um, they're turning out from their institutions, but that wasn't your point. So um, I actually am a great believer that we, right now, should be sitting down and having a serious look about our investment in agriculture, and that includes investment in the, you know, the STEM investment that we, that we have, uh, the increased STEM investment we're having in schools so that the, the young students that are coming through have got the basic skills to enable them to take on an agricultural science um, um, career into the future. But I think one of the things that we do need to do is we need to turn around and we need to find out from industry much more clearly and much better than we currently are exactly what it is that you want. Um, in the area, one of the areas that I work in, forestry is a classic example. We have very little opportunity for us to, um, to train um, and educate people for future um, careers in the forestry sector. So I think the time has come, and, and, I, and I, I mean, I'm not going to um, start entering off into Simon Birmingham as the Education Minister's um, area, but I do agree with you. The influence needs to be, we need to clearly understand what the market demand for, for any of our courses, whether they be agricultural or not, and, and make sure that we've got the right um, settings in place in our, in our tertiary institutions and even in our secondary institutions to make sure that the skills that we're building up in our young people will be the skills that we need into the future. Um, so I'm going to take that one away and I'll have a word to, to Minister Birmingham as to the, you know, what, what was the rationale behind the decision making in, uh, in the tertiary sector for, for the, the change in the research funding that's going there. But I think the broader issue here is to make sure that industry has uh, a very clear say in what our 
um, R&D outcomes are into the future, what our research outcomes are into the future, because quite plainly um, it bothers me that we've got so many silos of research um, going on across the whole of industry and often none of them actually know what the other one's doing. And at the risk of being tremendously controversial, I wonder why we've got 15 separate RDCs. At what point do we actually get better cross-pollination about delivering an agricultural out, um, um, sort of future for Australia if we continue to do our research in silos? Um, we continue to do research at the CSIRO. We do it within our R&D organisations within industry. We do it within tertiary institutions. Um, and it's time, I think, that we actually brought everybody together and actually had a much more united conversation about what it is that we want for the future development of our industry. Because if we don't do that, we're not going to achieve the outcomes that we want.